All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Lata. I'm an uh, application architect at FINRA. Uh, this is my first time at DevOps Days, and I'm very excited to be here and to share with you uh, uh, FINRA's uh, enterprise scale container migration journey. So let's get started. So a quick agenda over here. Uh, we will start with a brief introduction about FINRA, and then we will uh, get into uh, the problem statement and the motivation for us to look into containers and the challenges that we faced along our journey. And then we will dive into different container management services uh, available on AWS, compare those services and see what solution we went ahead. And that will lead us into looking at the desired architecture and automation that we put in place. And finally, we will look at all this in action with the demo, and I will wrap it up with uh, some of the best practices that we learned that you could take home. Okay, I can do it. Okay. okay, so FINRA is uh, uh, a non-government organization. We are primarily responsible for uh, regulating broker dealers and market exchanges. Our mission is to protect investors and to ensure market integrity. We currently uh, oversee about 12 market exchanges and uh, regulate about 3,800 firms and 634,000 broker dealers currently working in the US. Uh, we are a big data company and on an average we have about 135 billion market events that get ingested into our system to be processed for surveillance. And we also store a huge amount of data which spans more than uh, 30 petabytes. When we reconstruct and replay this market data, we land up creating trillions of nodes and edges. This kind of gives you an idea of the complexity of data we deal with. And to analyze this market data, we use more than 50,000 compute nodes on an average per day. And currently on production, we have about 150 applications running. So this gives you an idea of the scale of applications we were trying to mi migrate. All right, so let's look at the problem statement. So before we started our uh, migration journey, we had two categories of applications based on their infrastructure need. The first category was our typical traditional on-premise uh, data center applications, and the other was the apps that we had already moved to the AWS cloud, but they were using more traditional infrastructure like auto-scaling group with a load balancer. And each of these apps had their own set of problems. So the on-premise applications, we were constantly battling with the uh, increased infrastructure costs, and we also did not have the capability of uh, dynamically scaling the infrastructure based on the application needs. And our release cycles were also very long. They sometimes spanned across months, and we lacked speed and agility in this entire process. And dependency management, management was also pretty uh, challenging, which was either done manually or with semi-automated scripts. And lastly, we did not have environment parity. So mostly we would have to deal with issues which did not surface on the lower environments, but did pop up in our production environment. On the AWS cloud, the cost did reduce to a certain extent as compared to our on-premise infrastructure, but it was still high and it only increased as we deployed more microservices onto the um, a cloud, because each microservice that we were deploying required its own auto-scaling group and it also required its own load balancer to be in place. We also had to deal with the slow build and deploy time, because now uh, the application-specific dependencies that had to be installed or configured on the EC2 instances had to be done every time the app gets deployed, and this sometimes uh, would run in order of 30 to 45 minutes, which is pretty high. And lastly, we still had to deal with the environment parity issue. So this is where Docker containers came in handy and helped us address most of these uh, problems. And we saw five main benefits moving to the containers. The first benefit was it was easily portable. I could now package my entire application and have a self-contained runtime sandbox environment which I could drop it on any host and have it running uh, easily. So it was easily portable. 
and it was also very cost efficient. I could fit in multiple containers into a single uh, uh, host and have multiple applications running and using my uh, compute to its maximum efficiency, but yet have the isolation that was required for each application. The third benefit was it was way faster, way faster than what we saw in the traditional model, because all the dependencies were packaged into the same uh, Docker container, and we, would use, uh, we could use Docker layers where I could have my base image, which had most of the dependencies packaged in it, and in my application image, I would only package the application code, which was the most frequently changing artifact. So we moved from 35 minutes of uh, deploy time to hardly a few couple of minutes of uh, build and deploy time. And the productivity of developers also improved significantly because we could have environment parity now. I could have immutable Docker images which I could tag and the same image could get deployed on my development environment and the same image could be deployed on my production environment and even on my local desktop if I want to test it. And all this we were able to achieve by having simplicity and keeping it lightweight. So all I had to deal with, as a, dev deal with uh, as a developer was I could have a Docker file defining all my application specific packages that need to be installed, and a Docker compose file which would define the relationship between uh, different containers which made up my app. So it was very simple and lightweight. All right, so once we decided to go with containers as a solution, the next logical step was to decide what kind of container management system do we want to put in place. Obviously, we did not want to implement something on our own, and that's when we looked at AWS for what services are available. And AWS offers uh, three uh, uh, services currently. One is the ECS with EC2 launch type. The other is uh, Fargate, which is more of a serverless solution. And then we have uh, EKS, which is uh, Kubernetes-based solution. So let's look at the pros and cons of each of these services. So with the ECS EC2 launch type, uh, the pros are it is very simple and easy to use, and it integrates very well with other AWS services like IAM and what we saw in the previous presentation, Parameter Store, and uh, it is also very, uh, it ha also has very low learning curve if you want to get started with it. The cons are with the simplicity comes lack of certain features. It does not give you fine-grained control of how you want to place your containers. And it also has overheads of uh, you have to, having to manage your cluster, which means you have to define your cluster scaling policies. And you also have to keep up to date with your AMIs that make your easy to host so that you are up to date with the security patches. But the use cases that it fits very well are with uh, uh, standalone jobs or bad jobs or any web applications which require UI, APIs, or microservices to be deployed. Now let's look at Fargate. Fargate, the pros are it is a serverless offering, so which means you don't have to, uh, you don't no longer have to do any AMI updates or manage your clusters on your own. It's automatically done for you. You just focus on your application, and you also have to don't uh, deal with uh, cluster scaling uh, overheads. The cons of the features that are currently missing are it lacks encrypted uh, storage, and it also doesn't have integration with uh, EFS, which is Elastic File System. So if you have any applications where your containers store certain state onto uh, EFS, then Fargate might not be the right option. And it uses ENI per task, so you have to be cognizant of the uh, account level ENI limits that you might hit. The use cases are very similar to what we saw with the EC2 launch type. Um, it supports web applications, standalone stand tasks, and bad jobs, and any stateless application where you would be managing your states externally, like on your RDS or uh, DynamoDB and so on. Let's now look at EKS. The pros with EKS are it gives you more uh, control. It has more uh, advanced features that you could leverage, and it is also has a huge open source ecosystem, which is very helpful. The cons are the learning curve to get onto UKS is pretty high as compared to ECS or Fargate, and uh, it requires more engineering effort to get a cluster up and to have it managed and so on. So the cluster management complexity is also a, a con here. So the use cases that it fits well are hybrid applications. So if you do not want to tie your application to a specific cloud provider, or if you have applications which have to be deployed, some applications have to be deployed on-prem and some onto the cloud, then you could use EKS as a solution and have similar infrastructure on both the environments. And it also fits very well for big data processing applications. 
And uh, off late, uh, most of the COTS products come with inbuilt support for EK, so it's a good fit for platform applications as well. So we chose to go with Amazon ECS, ECS because when we started our journey, ECS with EC2 launch type was the only service available. But we want to get to Fargate, uh, but uh, uh, the lack of encrypted storage is something that is uh, preventing us from moving to Fargate. So we chose ECS, EC2 launch type as a solution because it's simple, easy to use, and it fits very well with most of our use cases. And it was easy to migrate from our traditional EC2 ELB model to uh, ECS ALB model. And we went with our approach of having a cluster per uh, business domain, so we could minimize to some extent the cluster management complexities. All right, so now let's look at the challenges. So once we identified the solution, the challenges we had to deal with was the volume of apps that we were migrating. And we also wanted security and compliance to be built into our continuous delivery pipeline right from the beginning and not have it as an afterthought. And all this was not possible without having the right automation in place, which would have best practices and desired architecture built into it and make it more seamless for uh, developers to have their applications deployed. And lastly, we had to have a rollout strategy so we could uh, get our developers up to speed and have more like a self-paced training so that they could get their apps deployed onto the cloud easily. So now let's look at a desired architecture. So we wanted clients to be able to reach the services or applications deployed on ECS via uh, the application load balancer. We chose to go with ALB because it's a layer seven load balancer and it gives you more advanced routing options, like you could uh, route your request based upon the content of your request, like your host name and path and so on. So ALB sits in front of ECS, which is uh, underneath a auto scaling group with a group of EC2 instances. And your images get pulled from uh, ECR, which is your repository for all your Docker images. And now you could have your different flavors of your applications deployed onto these EC2 instances, like your Spring Boot apps, Angular apps, monolithic Tomcat-based apps, and so on. And each of this uh, app can, is uh, maps to an ECS service, which is running multiple copies of your um, uh, task. And um, uh, each task is a group of Docker containers. So as you can see, we have uh, a pattern here. We have an identity gateway container, which sits in front of an app, app container. And the IG container takes care of uh, authenticating and authorizing your requests and routes only the authenticated requests to the application container. And we went with the approach of having a sidecar for Splunk, which would uh, also work later on with Fargate for all our uh, logging requirements. And on the EC2 host, we had uh, we used the collect D uh, daemon, which is an open source utility which helps with uh, capturing a lot of your metrics like your CPU, memory, and so on. And we also made sure that the EC2 instances were distributed across uh, different availability uh, zones so that they are uh, highly available and resilient. And the AMIs that get deployed onto these EC2 instances were uh, FINRA's ECS optimized AMI, which is basically an extension from the Amazon provided AMI. And we built into it the uh, CIS specification for Docker, and we also have uh, security scanning implemented for containers using uh, Cloud Passage Halo agent. So it makes the AMI secure and compliant. And for the base images, we uh, built certain uh, uh, compliant FINRA base images based upon different kinds of uh, flavors of apps we had, which had all the common uh, dependencies packaged into them and was also had security and compliance built into them. And as an application developer, I would only extend from one of these compliant base images and only take care of packaging my code. Okay, now let's look at infrastructure automation. So uh, we uh, implemented a tool called Provision, which is a CLI-based tool, which helps you create resources on uh, the cloud. And it wraps around uh, CloudFormation and AWS SDK, ECS CLI, and many other tools like uh, FINRA's own open source tool called uh, Fidelius, which helps you with secret management and so on. But the more main uh, important feature that Provision provides is that it has standards, compliance, and security built into it, along with certain reasonable defaults, which help you bring up your stack in a, uh, uh, faster and in an easier way. 
So for example, if you are, uh, say, provisioning an RDS instance, it would make sure that encryption is turned on by default. Or if you are bringing up an ALB, it will make sure that your listeners are secure on 443 and 8443. So using this tool, you can now create your ECS stack, which is underneath an autoscaling group. It will also help you create your ALB stack with certain secure listeners and default target groups. And your ECR repos, where you would uh, store your images. And finally, the uh, service task, which is basically your uh, application that is uh, running with your containers in it. So the delivery pipeline, we um, had a pipeline for ECS. Here, the, uh, uh, in, the, the infrastructure itself is defined as code. So the code gets built and archived and stored on S3. And the same code is used to bring up your uh, cluster on your development environment and then gets promoted to your QA environment and then to your production environment, which could be different AWS accounts. And a similar pipeline for your ALB, because you could have multiple uh, apps or multiple microservices deployed to the same cl cluster, sharing the same uh, ALB. So we have a separate stack for ALB, which defines all your listeners and so on. And finally, you would have multiple pipelines for uh, different microservices that you would have. So the concept is still similar. You package your code, then you build your uh, Docker image from that code, and you tag it and push it to ECR. Um, and the built uh, Docker image, which is a tar file, is stored onto S3, and that gets promoted to different AWS accounts and gets pushed to ECR. So you basically build your Docker container once and promote it across multiple uh, environments and have same parity across different environments. So let's now look at... Uh, the demo. All right, so here I have uh, my uh, microservice, which is basically a Spring Boot app. And uh, I'm using um, uh, Maven for building my application. And here's my Docker file, which is basically extending from my uh, base image. And all that I'm doing is packaging my configuration and code onto it and a startup script, uh, which is a, a very simple startup script that is just launching my application. And then I... Um, I have my Docker Compose file, which is defining my containers and the relationship between them. So I just have the uh, FIP and the app container over here. And I have another Docker Compose file, which is basically defining my local environment so that I can build it easily locally. And once I have my Docker files, all my environment configurations are defined in their specific uh, environment files. So I have a single Docker file, but different environment files based on where I'm deploying it. And now I will build my code. I'm going to do a Maven build so that I get my application jar. And once I have my application jar, I would uh, use CloudPass. It's another tool to get a temporary token to my AWS. And then I log into my uh, ECR repository. And I'm defining an image tag so that I can use the tag to build my uh, image. And here I'm building my uh, Docker containers and I have it tagged with the, the tag that I defined. And now I am going to launch my containers, launch my application using the same Docker Compose uh, file. So all this is happening locally. This is basically my development environment. And as you can see, the containers are coming up. Uh, it launches my FIP container, which is my identity gateway container. And then it brings up my app container, which is uh, my Spring Boot application. And within minutes, I would have my uh, complete app running. So I could make changes and d uh, bring it up as many times as I want locally. And you can see that I'm now able to hit my uh, microservice. So that was the authentication that the FIP container asked for. And here's my API running locally. Uh, so it was very easy for me to deploy everything on Docker and um, see it running locally. All right, so now I have all this running locally, so the next step is for me to deploy to ECS. So the same setup I'm going to deploy to ECS. So here I have my infrastructure, which is defined as code, which basically the provision tool would help me with. I'm using the same Docker Compose file, which is going to create a task definition on, my, um, uh, uh, on the cloud. And here I have the configuration for the target group, then my ECS service, and uh, I also have environment-specific configurations for anything which is specific to the infrastructure resource I'm uh, deploying to that specific environment. 
And now I would uh, invoke the provision tool by saying use my local profile and bring up a fresh stack. So what this is doing is it's deploying my ECS service, uh, and, uh, and this is assuming that the ALB and the uh, cluster is already uh, available and set up. OK, here my stack is already running. It's in progress. And it's creating all the resources. And if you uh, go back here, the provision tool, you can see that it's, underneath it's using the ECS CLI to create my uh, task definition based on the Docker Compose. And it's also creating the stack and registering the DNS names and so on. So once this is up, I would now want to, uh, yeah, I can see that my stack is uh, complete. And now I would want to launch and test whether my endpoint is fine. So it's the same endpoint, same code that I had running locally, which is now getting launched from uh, AWS. So here I can see that my endpoint is fine, and I can see the uh, response from my uh, API that got invoked. OK, so the next step is how do I have all this in a continuous delivery fashion? So here's my um, CI CD pipeline, again defined as code. Uh, we are using a, a, a wrapper that we built called F3, which is based on the jobs DSL, and it helps me define all pipelines again as code. So what you're seeing here is the app job, and I'm having all the different stages of my uh, pipeline defined in code. It's uh, using the builder pattern, so I have a series of API calls with the right configuration. And once I have this uh, infrastructure as code defined, I can create a seed job which is going to use this code and launch my, uh, create all the pipelines for me automatically. So you can see that it created a pipeline for my uh, ECS cluster. It uh, created um, a pipeline for my uh, ALB. And um, uh, I'll have another pipeline for my um, a microservice. So everything is code, and I can regenerate these pipelines uh, as and when I want to make changes, and everything is like uh, uh, tagged and versioned appropriately. OK, so now I'll make a change to my microservice. I'm going to add another uh, uh, book object to it, and I'm going to um, uh, um, commit this to my Bitbucket repo and see how the CI CD pipeline will now get triggered and get deployed. So here my build job is uh, getting triggered, which is going to package my uh, application code. And once the application code is packaged, it is now building my uh, Docker uh, container. So you can see that it has like, packaged all my code, which involves my infrastructure code, as well as my application code, and the, um, uh, the Docker tar as well. So once the uh, Docker image gets created, uh, it gets built once and stored on S3. And I'm going to push this Docker image onto my development environment and bring up a stack on uh, uh, my development environment using the same provision tool that I use locally. So here you can see as the job is running, I have my uh, stack in progress. And once this finishes, I can test my um, uh, API again, which would which should show me the change that I uh, committed. So I'm launching another stack, so it's hitting another DNS uh, name, and I can see that my change to the API is getting reflected. So you can see that I had this environment parity, and I was easily able to test my application between environments. Okay, so let's move on now. OK, some of the best practices. So since we are on ECS, it is very important for us to right-size our cluster and services, define the scaling policies that are required. So you would, uh, uh, it is highly recommended that you profile your applications and see how, what you would need when you have to serve peak load, both for your cluster EC2 instances, as well as the number of uh, ECS service instances that you will need. And um, the second best practice is it is very important to spread your tasks across uh, different availability zone by using uh, placement strategies on your, um, uh, on your ECS. And also, by, uh, you have to spread your task across different instances so that you don't bin pack multiple uh, containers onto same host by using placement constraints. And lastly, it's very important to have uh, right logging and monitoring in place monitoring to know if your app is going down, and logging so that you can analyze any issues that you might uh, hit. 
And for deployment strategies, there are multiple options available. Uh, uh, Blue-green is one option where you would, uh, uh, you would bring up a parallel stack, which is your green environment. And once you're happy with your uh, green environment, you tear down the blue environment, and the green becomes your active version. So you could do that in multiple ways, uh, uh, by using ALB DNS switch, or you could do a target group uh, switch. And uh, blue-green deployment is uh, very helpful in many use cases. But there are certain cases where it might not work. For example, if your application cannot, uh, if two versions of your applications cannot handle the same uh, database, then probably blue-green deployment is not uh, the right option. The other option is to do a zero downtime deployment, wherein you can do a rolling update where uh, ECS would take care of uh, um, rolling out your current versions of your containers and bring up the new versions based upon the healthy uh, percentage that you define. So you would not see a downtime, downtime in your app. ECS will take care of it uh, automatically in the background by rolling out the container versions. All right, so currently in production, we are uh, now having 100 plus clusters, and uh, we have more than 200 plus uh, EC2 instances running with more than 500 active uh, ECS tasks running at any given point in time, which maps to around uh, 300 plus uh, ECS services. So that's the scale of applications we are running currently on ECS. So in the future, uh, we are looking at uh, adopting uh, Fargate, which is more of a serverless uh, solution. And we are also looking at EKS, more specifically for big data processing use cases. And we plan to open source the provision tool that you just saw uh, by end of the year. And these are some of our other uh, open source tools out there. Uh, we have uh, Gatekeeper, which, so if you have a burning production issue and you really need to get onto the EC2 box or you need to log into your RDS instance, Gatekeeper comes very handy. It gives you uh, temporary access to those uh, resources and there's a complete audit trail of who requested, who approved, and it automatically expires the request once the duration is over. Uh, we have uh, the YUM Nginx API, which helps with uh, uploading your uh, RPMs. And then we have uh, Affilion, which uh, is, uh, it has a nice to use a dashboard, which gives you uh, an idea of the uh, service limits that you're approaching on AWS and alerts you so that you can take care of uh, increasing the limits. And uh, we recently open sourced uh, Fidelius, which is a secrets management tool. It comes with a nice to use uh, UI, much better than the AWS console, I would say. And um, it also gives you uh, SDK, which um, uh, helps you with the aut automation needs for you to pull secrets. And it has the complete versioning and history of secrets and so on. And uh, in the future, we plan to open source Provision and CloudPass, the, the, tool that, the CLI tool that we saw, which gives you temporary access to uh, AWS. And lastly, Portus, which helps you with security group management based upon certain security policies defined. With that, uh, I come to the end of my session. Um, thank you all for listening in. I'll be around, so if you have any questions, reach out to me. Thank you.